the battleship counterpart to the Lexingtons, the original South Dakota class, no, not that one, were rather less scattershot in their design process. Ultimately, just a continuation of the existing standard type, which we'll be beginning into. The South Dakotas were, in large part, mostly a side grade rather than a proper upgrade in battleship design. An improvement, yes, but not anything really revolutionary like Hood over in the United Kingdom. Because even when Congress was finally willing to fund ships, instead of making the Navy search for pocket change from their admirals, the Navy board still, on its own part, resisted anything truly revolutionary. Remember when I went over the Lexingtons and the fast battleship versions thereof? Yeah, those things weren't really interesting in the Navy. Congress was actually willing to fund ships, but the Navy just wanted to get more of the same. Some improvements, but more of the same. Fast battleships would, after all, have obsoleted the entire standard type that they had just spent a decade fighting so hard for, and were seen as not worth the cost. Mind you, this was with the Navy generally unaware of how fast the Japanese Nagato-class ships actually were, so go figure. When you think most ships are about the same speed, but they aren't, well, I guess the Navy would have learned that lesson eventually. At any rate, the standards were called such as they were intended to be largely similar to each other, and able to operate as one fleet unit. By building ships with, again, more or less, the same turning circle, the exact same speed, and broadly similar firepower, it was thought that the Navy could get around the problem of only getting one or two battleships in a good year. If you can't build an entire squadron in one pop, unlike pretty much every European Navy other than Italy, then the next best thing was just making all your ships be more or less the same. You know, work with what you have and all that. The United States didn't always have all the money to throw at the problems, after all. By making all your ships more or less the same, you don't have to build as many to get the same concentration of force. This would rather be a problem, though, as the last of these ships were being built. With this in mind, we get to World War I, and the American Congress and public suddenly looking at the Navy and asking, Hey, why do these Euros have so many more ships than we do? Aren't we the best in the world? And the Navy looking back and going, With what money, though? With the two people staring at each other here, the Navy and Congress, with the public kind of just going, What's going on? The Naval Act of 1916 would be signed into law, and American industry starts going, Burt. Granted, with the U-Boat Menace Round 1 a thing, this was largely focused into lots and lots and lots and lots and lots... <coughs> lots of destroyers. Just like with the Lexingtons, this would delay the construction of the South Dakotas, not really helped by the General Board wanting a Navy equal to the British, with the argument that any power that won in Europe would be rich off what they took from the losers, and filled with millions of veteran troops and ship crews. Not, as it turned out, exhausted ruins of themselves. Man, they really missed the mark there, didn't they? With the British and Japanese fleets getting overall faster in speed, not by much, outliers like the battle cruisers and the Queen Elizabeth and the Gatos aside, the USN decided they needed a bit more speed of their own. Unwilling, though, to go for fast battleships, even though it was entirely possible. The next best thing they decided would be 23 knots as the new standard, if you will. This would more or less match the average speed of the British and Japanese, who were seen as the probable enemy. Of course, their ships were only averaging the speed at that point, because, oh boy, the British and Japanese were starting to go much faster, as we'll soon see. Which is why 23 knots doesn't seem like much. But in the atmosphere of the mid-1910s, remember these ships were designed around 1916 through 1918. It's just World War I kind of intervened and prevented them from being built. It didn't stand out too much. For now, 
Suffice it to say that a lot of the increase in tonnage in these ships, they got like 10,000 more tons out of the South Dakotas compared to the Colorados, their immediate predecessors. A lot of that increase went into the power plant, prompting one of the more unique features of the ship in its trunked funnel design. Not quite as bad as the all the funnels variant of the Lexingtons, those. Those ships, yeah, they were a thing. The next point where the South Dakotas jumped ahead of their predecessors would be in deck armor. While the belt armor would remain largely the same as the standards, deck armor was more or less doubled in comparison. Because even back then, the United States Navy was starting to recognize that plunging fire was much more dangerous than direct hits to belt armor. For those unaware, plunging fire is when you fire at long distance and the shells arc up and then, you know, plunge down and hit the deck armor. Most ships designed prior to World War I didn't really have deck armor because it was thought everyone would fight at close range and the belt would be what was getting hit. Turns out that really wasn't the case. In that regard, and somewhat related, the next point where the South Dakotas would jump ahead of the standards would be in raw firepower. Previous battleships had, this is a generalization, progressed relatively little in firepower. A couple more guns here and there, at least in the standards, because after the standards jumped from 12 to 14 inch guns, the Navy didn't get the chance to jump again for quite a while because the Secretary of the Navy was like, yeah, I'm not going to fund your 16-inch guns, Navy. Keep building these 14-inch guns. They're cheaper. So you have the Nevadas, which have 10 14-inch guns, and then you jump to every other following class until the Colorados, just adding two more guns to get 12 14-inch guns. And then even the Colorados themselves were basically just the Tennessee class, their immediate predecessors, but with twin 16-inch guns instead of triple 14-inch guns. Otherwise, the ships are pretty much identical. That's when we reach the South Dakotas, which look at that switch and go, but what if we go back to triples with even bigger 16-inch guns? And the Congress going, okay... These guns, 50 caliber in comparison to 45 caliber, would have thrown the same shells, at least at this point, but with a much heavier broadside due to the four extra barrels. Also, with higher caliber, they would have thrown the shells even further, which is where I get back to plunging fire being a thing. It's also the beginning of the fascination the United States Navy would have with fighting at extreme ranges, at least by European standards. Even come World War II, we were still building our ships to shoot further than European ships were. That being said, the layout of these weapons was still the same as the other standards. Two super-firing forwards and two super-firing aft. Even in secondary weapons, the South Dakotas would look at the standards and go, but what if we went bigger? Instead of the ubiquitous 5-inch guns, the ships would move to heavier 6-inch weapons, the same as those mounted in the Lexingtons and eventually the Omahas. In a concession to the uselessness of hull-mounted casemates, something I'll get into with ships actually using them, suffice to say that water is a bit of an issue there, these would be mounted entirely in the superstructure for the first time in an American battleship. Interesting side note here. The South Dakotas and Lexingtons would ultimately prove to be the only American big gun capital ships to ever mount 6-inch secondary guns. The later fast battleships would revert, even in the massive Montanas, to 5-inch guns. Back to the South Dakotas, though. They rounded out their firepower with four 3-inch anti-aircraft guns that would probably have been about as useful as flinging angry words to the sky, and a pair of underwater torpedo tubes that were equally as useless, but in the direction of ships instead of planes. Still, when all is said and done, the South Dakotas were far heavier armed than any American or foreign ship built before them. For all that firepower, though, they still had the same belt thickness as the standards, and when one looks at the ships, they would see something that would fit right into the existing battle line other than their trunked funnels. They had the same minimalist superstructure and lattice mass, already proving to be a problem on other ships. Easy enough to replace, 
grant, I grant you, but a sign of the conservative nature of these ships. The belt armor is a reflection of this, as in spite of the ships themselves mounting much heavier guns, and this isn't even getting into foreign navies where 18-inch guns were starting to become a real thing, the armor hadn't been increased from the standards, the first of which were designed well before the First World War, with all that implies. It is hardly thin armor, and again, plunging fire was generally becoming much more of a threat than direct hits to the belt. But if you're going to armor a battleship, one would think you should increase it as other navies, and your own navy for that matter, get bigger and more powerful guns. However, I want to note here that this is not as big a problem as it may seem. It is a problem, but not as big as one of you may think. The ships still had thicker armor than the Japanese equivalent in Tosa, and thicker deck armor in this case too. And the difference in belt and deck armor in comparison to the British N3 or G3 really isn't that huge. A couple of inches, really. It is a factor, but it's not as big of a factor as you may think it is. Especially balanced against the fact that there would have been six South Dakotas in comparison to four and threes and two Tozas. We're not going to count the G3s here. They're more directly compared to the Lexingtons. Which is a poor comparison for the Lexingtons, but that's an entirely different story. As well as this, while the N3s may seem superior in having 18-inch guns, the actual weight of broadside is very, very similar between the N3s and the South Dakotas. Heavier shells are a good thing, but balanced against a smaller number of barrels, it's not as big of a difference as you would think. Especially considering prior to the advent of radar-guided gunfire and the like, Number of guns far outweigh the size of the shell, at least when the guns were pretty comparable to each other. There isn't that much of a difference between a good 16-inch shell and a good 18-inch shell. This is not to say that the South Dakotas were perfect. Far from it. They would have been far outmatched in speed by anything but the slower in threes, in comparison to other ships being built. Their turboelectric drive, which the Navy was extremely fascinated with at the time, was efficient and powerful, but also heavy and vulnerable to damage. The difference in armor and broadside weight wasn't major, but it was there. Had the Washington Conference not canceled them, they would probably have been obsolete in short order as the Navy was forced to dig up the fast battleship designs to counter foreign construction. This is assuming the British and Japanese didn't completely collapse under the weight of their economies breaking down from attempting to outbuild the future arsenal of democracy, anyway. It's also where the story of the South Dakotas of the 1920s ends, at least as ships in their own right. The six ships, South Dakota, Indiana, Montana, North Carolina, Iowa, and Massachusetts, were canceled by the Washington Naval Treaty alongside their foreign competitors and the Lexingtons. Unlike the Lexingtons, though, none of them would ever be converted into other ships. They would all be scrapped, their armor and guns being used in refits of other ships or in land fortifications, with the 6-inch guns seeing the most service aboard the Omaha-class scout cruisers and some particularly heavily armed submarines. Interestingly, all the ships would have had their names reused. In the case of South Dakota herself, Iowa, and North Carolina, in the form of the name ships of later fast battleships. Save for poor Montana. That unlucky name would also be assigned to the Montana-class battleships, successors to the Iowas, who were cancelled in their own right. Ouch. A final note here, too. The 16-inch guns almost saw service aboard battleships 20-odd years later. The Iowas were originally intended to use them. However, due to a conga line of miscommunications, the ships were designed in ways where the guns wouldn't fit, and an entirely new gun had to be developed. That this would lead to the very excellent 16-inch 50 Mark VII, well, that's a story for another video.